Today, I'm going to start the next chapter on the sun. So what you're looking at, since it's just music, is the surface of the sun. And it looks this way because it's basically uh, gases that are um, kind of, I guess you would consider it like bubbling up to the surface. So imagine if you're looking at the surface of a pot of boiling water, only on the sun, it's gas. So that's part of what we're going to talk about. Um, the main part today being the structure of the sun. So uh, you can see from the oops, let me get my iPad up. From the diagram on the left, oh, let's close heyday. All right. Keynote. Give me a second. All right. Oh, come on, iPad, why don't you work? Yeah. All right. I had to connect my pencil again. All right, so the top half of this is um, if you were to cut the sun in half from the top to the bottom, you're looking at the core here. This is where um, nuclear fusion occurs. And then you have just outside the core, you have what's called the radiative zone. Above that is what's called the convective zone. Above that is the photosphere. This is the, what we would consider the surface of the sun. And then above that, you have the three layers of the atmosphere. You have the chromosphere. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, the photosphere, the chromosphere, and the corona. So we're gonna talk about all of that today. Throughout most of human history, people thought that the sun burned some type of fuel to make energy. It wasn't until the 21st century that scientists figured out where the sun's energy comes from, and that is fusion. It's another beautiful day in Sydney. I'm out enjoying the sun and looking to find out if anyone knows why the sun shines. So the sun gives us a lot of heat, yeah. sunshine. It provides energy, yeah, heat energy. Yeah, life, really. Where does the sun get that energy from? I have no idea. I have no idea. Some kind of chemical reaction? Mm, yeah, gas explosions. Doesn't it burn gas? The burning of gases. It's burning up. Fire. The fire that's on the sun? But is the sun really a giant ball of fire? Nope. I mean, wouldn't it go out after five billion years? It's one of those things that you just assume you know, but then you don't actually know. So in this bucket, I have the components of the sun. Well, I have uh, protons and neutrons. There are some electrons, but I didn't bring them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the sun is actually protons. Okay. And so what do the protons do in the sun? It dance together. <laughs> Whoa, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. But when they come close, you know what they do? They just Collide. well, actually, they they bounce off each other. I'm coming in. Whoa! Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> oh. oh! Why do the protons bounce off each other? Something to do with electrons? <laughs> Positive, negative yeah. electrons. Yeah. Because they don't like each other. They don't like each other. <laughs> That's what it is. That's because a proton needs a neutron, right? Do you know why they they repel like that? Magnetic force. The repelling magnet. Type thing. Magnus field? Uh... Electric field. Positive and negative. Positive and negative. It's to do with the positive negative, right? We got protons. Protons Opposite are? Positive. 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 So the positive Positively charged. Yeah, so the yeah. positives yeah. repel each other. Okay, okay. Yeah. This is why it's so important that the sun's hot, because if the sun is hot enough, it gets these things moving so fast that sometimes they can't avoid a collision. Okay. And when they get too close, they actually go. <laughs> An explosion. It goes everywhere. Wow. Right. 
smash the front dance? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 smash. Oh. <laughs> and now they're stuck together. And you saw what happened when they smashed together. They what leaked. happened? They leaked. <laughs> Is that energy? Yeah. Sick. Well, the water poured out, but I guess energy would have poured out. Yeah. The energy, the energy came out. Came the out. energy came out. What was the energy before it was energy? Kinetic the energy. Stored energy. <laughs> so right. what's happening there? It's releasing some mass yeah, by yeah. colliding. And that mass is... Uh... It's converted into energy. <laughs> yeah. It was the mass of the protons. Oh, oh. Oh. Yeah. Right. When the protons smashed together, they got lighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they lost that mass, and the mass was converted to energy. You know a famous yeah, yeah. equation about that? Yeah. E equals, e equals mc squared. MC squared. Yeah. E equals mc squared. E equals mc squared. Have you heard that famous equation? Which? <laughs> Proton and makes energy? Well... <laughs> e equals mc squared, yes. So what's E? The sun, I don't know. <laughs> e, is, e is energy, um, M is mass. mass. C is... Cassidy. Carbon? I don't remember what C means. So C is... The speed of light. Speed of light? No. Right? Really? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was... Isn't that weird? Different. The speed of light. Right. Ah. Uh. Wow. Wait, wait, no wonder we drop signs. It seems most people have a tough time remembering that C is for the speed of light. Maybe that's because C is a bit of a strange letter to represent a speed. In fact, in Einstein's original paper, he used the letter V for velocity of light. But nowadays, everyone uses the letter C for constant. It's a constant of the universe, the speed of light. Though some people claim the letter C stands for caleritas, the Latin word for swiftness. What is that equation telling us about energy and mass? Energy equals constant mass. The mass and the energy combined together create the energy. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically saying, like, this mass that comes out yeah. gets converted to a lot of energy. And the speed of light is a huge number. Yeah. Do yeah, so you think is. about that? Tiny bit of mass is a huge amount of energy. So every second, the sun is actually losing 4.3 billion kilograms. Every second. Mm -hmm. so that amount of mass is being converted into energy. In the sun, hydrogen fuses together to form helium. But that's a little confusing because how out of only protons do we create a helium nucleus which has two protons and two neutrons? Well, the thing is, when the first two smash together, one of the protons actually emits a positron and a neutrino and quickly becomes a neutron. Next thing that happens is another proton smashes in. And again, we get more energy released. Now, if two particles like this collide, they emit two protons, and what we're left with is the helium-4 nucleus. There you have hydrogen fused into helium. And a lot of mass lost, a lot of energy released. If you want to know more about Okay, so um, I like his videos because he goes out and like kind of asks people in the street if they understand or if they know the principles behind it. And it's actually surprising how little people know about the environment around them. Um, the specifics of uh, nuclear fusion, I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. Maybe not today, I don't know if I'll get to it today. Um, hopefully you guys all grew up being told by adults that you should not look at the sun directly, unlike a former certain American president who stared right at the sun because he's an idiot. Um, so obviously scientists have to use special instruments to study the sun. We know that our sun is made of 75% hydrogen and the rest is helium. And as I said in the beginning, there are several different areas. Now there's three major regions and two of those regions are further broken down into specific zones. So first we have the core. Second, we have the inner zones, which are the radiative and convective zone. And then third, we have the atmosphere, which is made of the photosphere, the chromosphere, I forgot an E. Um, I did not draw this by the way. Uh, somebody named Derek Owens, uh, copyright 2009. Anyway. Uh, and then there's the corona as well. He forgot about the corona. And the corona should be kind of out here. So we'll talk about each of those separately. As I said, the inner zones are made of uh, 
two layers and the atmosphere is made of three layers. Even though they have different layers, they're all continuous, which means there is a gradual change. There isn't like a very specific boundary where you've got um, on one side of this line is the convective zone and on the other side of this line is the uh, radiative zone. It doesn't work like that. So let's start with the core. The core makes up 10% of the sun's diameter. The entire diameter of the sun is 1.3 million kilometers. Um, just as a comparison, Earth's diameter, and I'm gonna round, it's like uh, just over 12 and a half thousand, but let's just call that 13,000 kilometers. So the sun is how many more times the diameter of Earth? Uh, one, two, three, where is it? A thousand times? I don't know. The temperature in the core is 15 million degrees, well beyond that magic number of 10 million that you need for um, fusion to start. At this temperature, no liquid or solid can exist. The sun is entirely made of gas, except at the core, because the, there's so much, um, there's such a high temperature at the core that it, the gas turns into plasma. So if you think about how we go from a solid to a liquid to a gas, we have to add heat energy, right? Or any kind of energy. So just speaking as temperature, if you heat up a solid, it will melt and turn into a liquid because that heat energy is being transferred to the atoms and it's being converted into kinetic energy. So the atoms in a solid can't move, but in a liquid, uh, they have enough energy to overcome the attractive forces that's holding the solid together and they can move around a little bit. And then if you add even more energy, heat energy, uh, you're going to excite the atoms in a liquid to where they start having a higher kinetic energy and they turn into a gas. And gases are generally uh, much less dense. They take up a lot more room because the atoms are, are moving around so quickly. So gases usually have volumes a thousand times more than uh, the same substance as a liquid. However, if you add even more energy uh, and you make the atoms go even faster, then a gas can be turned into something called plasma. This is not the same thing as your plasma TV at all, um, but there's lots of plasma in the universe. And basically what happens is when you give a gas enough energy, uh, the atoms become so excited that the outer valence electrons actually get ripped off of the atom. So plasma is basically a, uh, a, a substance that is highly ionized because you have the... Uh, the nucleus and the inner shell electrons, which are going to be positively charged in the same mixture as all of these valence electrons that got ripped away. So it's a very uh, highly polarized um, substance. The sun's mass is 300,000 times bigger than Earth. So obviously, if mass increases, the gravity is greater. In the center of the sun, even though it's 15 million degrees, it's 10 times more dense than iron, which if you think about is a very odd thing to try to picture in your head because iron is a solid. And if something is more dense than a solid, you would expect that to also be solid, but it's not, it's plasma. Okay, so just going again over how plasma is created, atoms, uh, are basically a nucleus surrounded by electrons. The heat and the pressure of the sun strips those electrons from the nuclei and then you have plasma. These nuclei that are left over can be changed by nuclear reactions. Now, when I say that electrons are stripped off, remember that the sun is 75% hydrogen. Hydrogen is made of one proton surrounded by one electron. So if you strip the electron, the only thing you're left with are protons. And then, like I said, later on, we'll go over um, the specific steps of uh, hydrogen fusion, which he talked about in the video, and each step releases energy. Okay. 
oh, I guess I'm going to talk about it now. <laughs> the specific steps of hydrogen fusion. Um, so the fuel in hydrogen fusion, and when I say fuel, I'm not talking about burning because fusion is not, um, not a combustion reaction. You're not actually burning anything. Um, it is a nuclear reaction, and that just means that it involves the nuclei of atoms, not, uh, not the, what do you call it, not the electrons, because normally in chemistry, when we talk about chemical reactions, which is our topic in chemistry at the moment, uh, synthesis reaction, decomposition, single double replacement combustion, all chemical reactions are a result of the interaction between electrons. But nuclear reactions are specifically just the nuclei of atoms. And in the sun's case, it is hydrogen atoms. Don't forget hydrogen atoms, um, the nucleus is going to be a proton. So you can interchange hydrogen, uh, hydrogen ion or a hydrogen nucleus with proton, it's the same thing. Hydrogen atoms are made of one proton, one electron. If that electron is ripped off, because plasma uh, is made in the core, then only the proton remains. So there are five steps to nuclear fusion. Looking at the key first, it's always important when you see a diagram to look for uh, the key to tell you, oh, my connection went away. What is going on with my iPad? Um, you have to look for the key so that you understand what it is you're looking at. So the key is down here. We have proton is in red, neutron is in gray, and positron, um, which is uh, a positive charge like an electron, but it's positive instead of negative. And you can't, I don't know why there, you can't see here, but um, this is the Greek letter gamma. That is, um, what do you call it? Uh, energy, Blech. my brain is not working so much today. And then neutrino is represented by V, I believe. I don't know why that's not in the key. But anyway, first thing that happens, you've got the two red circles or the two red balls. They are going to be the hydrogen nuclei and they are going to collide and fuse together. Now, normally you can have two, uh, two protons collide, but they're going to repel each other and bounce off because protons have a positive charge. So you would not expect them to actually stick together at all ever, except for the fact that um, in the core of the sun, they are under intense heat and pressure, 15 million degrees in the core. Uh, and so that can translate to kinetic energy. So you imagine what the kinetic energy of something that's 15 million degrees and it's under intense pressure. Remember the density is 10 times greater than iron. So you have a ton of material in a very, uh, a relatively small space at a very high temperature flying around at very high speeds. And so when they collide, they actually fuse together. One of those protons changes to a neutron. And this is why the, the positron is given off. So if you have a proton that releases a positron, which is basically just like a positive charge, then you have a neutron, right? Because protons and neutrons basically have the same mass. So if you take a proton, you release the positive charge, you're left with a neutron. And that's why you've got the positron that comes off here. Number three, another proton combines with the proton neutron pair, which makes uh, two protons and a neutron. Then two of these are going to collide together. So you would basically have one, two, three, four protons and got two neutrons, right? If this and this goes together and that is going to throw off two protons and you're left with two protons and two neutrons. This is a helium nucleus. Okay, so this is how you fuse hydrogen nuclei together to form the helium nucleus.
at each step energy is given off. However, the nucleus of helium has about 0.7% less mass than all of the hydrogen nuclei that combined to form it. That loss in mass is because it was converted into energy. So the question then becomes, how much energy are we talking about? This is uh, it's called a Hu uh, Hoover, the Hoover Dam. Um, I think it's in California. I'm not quite sure. I don't remember. Uh, let, me, let me ask Google real quick. Oh, it's in Nevada. Okay. So it's in the Southwestern United States. It's in Nevada. And it provides energy to uh, the entire West Coast of the United States, which includes California. I think that's why I was thinking California. It produces 400 million megawatts of power per year. Then we have the sun, which produces 380 billion billion megawatts of power every second. That is how much energy is produced through nuclear fusion. If you wanna know how much 380 billion billion is, it's that. 400 million, uh, let's see, 400, that's 400 million. So this amount of energy to, oop, this amount of energy for the entire Western United States per year, or this much energy per second. This is why scientists are trying to figure out how to do what's called cold fusion. They want to be able to uh, fuse atoms together, but without needing the 10 million, or yeah, without, excuse me, without having to have the 10 million degrees because there is nothing, no substance on earth uh, that can contain 10 million degrees without melting. So uh, the entire process of nuclear fusion was unknown at the time that Einstein proposed his most famous equation, E equals MC squared. We didn't know about nuclear fusion. This is back when, sorry. Um, this is back when people thought uh, that the sun was literally burning fuel, that it was just like a giant ball of fire. So what does E equals MC squared mean? E is the energy, M is mass, and C is the speed of light. Now the speed of light is a constant, which means it does not change ever, which means mathematically you can ignore it in an equation because it never changes. So what you're left with is basically energy equals mass or mass equals energy. This explains nuclear fusion and explains that loss of 0.7% mass because it's converted into energy. That equation can be used to calculate the amount of energy made from a given amount of matter. Astronomers can explain large amounts of energy that the sun makes using a, only a small amount of fuel. I think I, get, I gave you the analogy before that if we were able to fuse one gram of hydrogen, which is about the weight of a paperclip or the mass of a paperclip, uh, you would be able to light a 100 watt light bulb, which is quite a bright light bulb for, was it a thousand years or 3000 years? I can't remember. On top of, let's just go back to this number. 380 billion billion megawatts every second. And the fact that you can keep a light bulb, I'm just gonna go with a thousand because I can't remember if it was one or three. Uh, one gram of hydrogen, a light bulb for a thousand years. The sun fuses more than 600 million tons of hydrogen every second, right? And a ton is a thousand kilograms. So, 600 million times a thousand, that's 100,000, that's million, that's 600 billion kilograms that you're converting per second. That's a crazy, crazy amount. And in the 4.6 billion years that the sun has been 
fusing, it's only used up about 5% of its hydrogen. So that's what happens in the core. Next, we get to the inner zones. So between the atmosphere and the core, you have inner zones. The radiative zone immediately surrounds the core, and the convective zone is outside of that. Both of the inner zones are named for the way or the method that energy is transferred. In the radiative zone, we go from 15 million degrees down to a cool two and a half million degrees, and the energy moves from atom to atom as radiation. I don't know if you remember, because I'm sure that teacher Vanessa taught you, there's three ways that energy can move. That's radiation. Second is convection. And three is conduction. Okay, those are the three methods uh, that energy uses to move around in space. So radiation is literally just traveling through space. Like if you were to pour a hot cup of water and you put your hand on top of the hot cup of water, you don't put your hand in the water, but on top of the water, you can feel the heat because the heat is radiating from the water. So that's how um, energy moves through the radiative zone. It's a transfer of energy through space. So here you've got the core radiative zone and the convective zone. The convective zone, here you can see, and I really like this diagram because the, the arrows show you exactly how the energy moves. Radiation from the core, it just radiates through space. Once you get to the convective zone, what is convection? Convection is hot air moves up, cold air sinks. That is convection. Just like um, if you have a multi-story house like I do, um, especially as it starts warming up like it is now, the third floor is always, because uh, I have three floors, the third floor is the hottest of all three floors because hot air rises, cold air sinks. So this is how energy is transferred in the convective zone. Again, we're going to cool off significantly. We're going from 15 million in the core, two and a half to the radiative zone, down to 1 million degrees in the convective zone. Again, convection, no, oh, the app keeps freezing. Uh, convection is the movement of energy through liquids and gases. Hot gases are going to rise up in the convective zone. And as it rises up, it's going to transfer that energy to the atoms above it. When it transfers the energy to the atoms above it, they're going to cool off and they will sink back down to the radiative zone, which again is two and a half times hotter because we have 2.5 million degrees here and only 1 million degree in the convective zone. So if you have, um, let me just go, yeah, here we go. So if you start with the gases here, it's a million degrees in this area, but it's two and a half million degrees further in. So the gases here are next to a much hotter environment. They're going to uh, absorb that energy from the radiative zone. That means that they're going to get more energy. They're going to rise up because they're hotter. As they rise up, they're going to transfer their energy to the gases above them. They will lose their energy, therefore the temperature decreases, they will sink back down to collect more energy. And you can see as you move towards the surface of the sun, the circles of the convection become much smaller. So as the atoms of the hot gases move out and expand from the, the radiative zone, they lose heat, those cooling gases become denser than other gases, they sink to the bottom. And when you see the surface, the quote surface of the sun, remember we use the term surface, but there, you can't stand on it. Um, but that's the photosphere, that's the bottom layer of the atmosphere, it's what we see from Earth. So that first video that I played in the very beginning, where it looks like a, like a bunch of boiling gases, it really is like boiling gases, because boiling is the same uh, not the same, but it's a similar kind of idea. 
So you have this rising and sinking as the gases rise up, they transfer their energy, they lose temperature, they lose their energy, they sink back down. Then we get to the atmosphere. The atmosphere is around the convective zone. There are three layers, the photosphere, the chromosphere, and the corona. Now, I don't know who draw this, I got this like years ago, but the photosphere they drew with a solid line because that's what we see from earth. The chromosphere is named uh, after uh, chromo, which means color. The corona is only visible during uh, solar eclipses. So I'll talk about those three. The innermost layer of the solar atmosphere is the photosphere. That is what you saw in the first video. It is made of gases bubbling up from the convective zone. That's why it looks um, grainy, I guess. But think about the fact that we're going, as we move out from the core, we are cooling off because the source of energy is made in the core, that heat is made in the core. And that energy has to be transferred to atoms as it moves out towards the surface and then finally escapes into space. The grainy appearance of the photosphere is called granulation. And that is, like I said in the beginning, very similar to um, what the surface of boiling water looks like, right? Even here you can see from far away, a much less uh, high res image of the surface, but it looks kind of bumpy, you know, it doesn't look very smooth. That's because of these rising and falling gases. And again, this is exactly what the surface looks like. This is the photosphere. And you can just kind of see like this almost like a rolling, rolling boil. And that's from the convective zone right underneath it. Most of the energy from the sun is given off as visible and heat, oh, sorry, visible, visible and heat, visible light and heat. That is what we see from earth. So we consider the photosphere, the quote surface. Next is the chromosphere, okay? So here, what you're looking at is the photosphere, really, really good uh, uh, illustration of granulation. You see how bumpy and rough the surface looks. But this red aura around the outside, that is the chromosphere. Chromo means color. So this is the second layer of the atmosphere. So it's the thin layer of gases that glows with a reddish light. And temperatures here range from four to 50,000. Now you might think, well, wait, I thought the photosphere was 6,000. And how are we gonna get like, hotter than that because we're moving further away. This is true and it gets even worse when we get to the corona and I'll explain that, I'll explain that uh, in a minute. Here's a really nice um, picture of the chromosphere. You can see just kind of like this pinkish reddish glow. The gases of the chromosphere are going to move away from and toward the photosphere. In their upward movement, they sometimes form narrow jets of hot gases, which is what you see here, kind of burping up from the surface, and then they'll eventually fade. Sometimes these jets can reach 16,000 kilometers in height, which again is uh, taller than the diameter of Earth. So this is the chromosphere right here, right? The orange part or the yellow part is the photosphere. This is the chromosphere and you can see how gases kind of go up, rise up and then fall just up and down like that. Very weird. And finally, the corona, which is Spanish for crown. It is the outermost layer of the sun's atmosphere. It is a huge cloud of gas that is heated by the sun's magnetic field to 2 million degrees. So this is why I was saying um, in the core you have 15 million, then you cool off to two and a half down to 1 million, 6,000 at the surface. But once you get past the surface and you start getting into the atmosphere, that's where you have a lot of effect from the magnetic fields on the sun. Now, I just wanted to uh, compare for a second. If we have earth, 
and we have an axis tilted at 105 degrees, which is what gives us our seasons. And this is the North Pole, this is the South Pole. Um, I'll just say that this, this is the sun because it's there. So you have solar wind and our magnetic field protects us from that solar wind. But then it also affects Earth's magnetic field. So if you were to look at a, a picture of Earth's magnetic field, you would see a lot like, imagine like um, if you've got long hair and you're standing in front of a fan, that the fan blows the hair in the front, but like it, it uh, flows behind you. This would be your face. Solar wind does the same thing because there are highly ionized particles that are part of solar wind um, and that push our magnetosphere uh, away at the back. But this is what protects us. If sometimes some of the radiation from the solar wind actually makes contact with the lines of the magnetic field, they get funneled down to both the North and South Pole, and that creates the um, Aurora Borealis, or Alola, as Ty like to say. Now, the indication of the strength of the ionization that's getting down to the North and South Pole is determined by how far south on the planet people can see the Northern Lights. Um, nobody really sees the Southern Lights because nobody lives down here except for maybe Australia, but usually you're talking about the Northern Lights. So like Northern Canada, um, the, what do you call it? Um, Scandinavia, like Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, maybe upper upper parts of Russia. Those are the guys that might see the Northern Lights, Alaska as well, because Alaska is way up there. Um, but if, for example, like down in uh, continental Europe or even um, Northern United States, if you see Northern Lights at this uh, latitude, then that means that it was a really, really strong uh, solar storm. We'll talk about more, uh, more solar activity uh, tomorrow. The corona is relatively thin and prevents most of the atomic particles from the sun's surface from escaping into space. So just going back to this real quick, you might say, well, what makes the gases fall back down? And that would be the corona. So even if they have energy and they kind of start to shoot up like you see there or over here, um, the corona keeps most of it in. But some electrically charged particles, which we know are called ions, can leak into space through holes in the corona. And this is what makes up solar wind. The chromosphere and the corona cannot be seen from Earth because of the brightness um, of the sky during the day. But during a solar eclipse, the moon blocks the sun, and then you can see the corona. There was um, maybe Ooh, I want to say two or three years ago, there was a partial solar eclipse that we could actually see here. I got a couple of pictures of it. It's very cool. The space in which the planet's orbit seems to be empty. However, it's not. It's full of matter from the sun. The sun generates powerful magnetic fields that rise above the surface in giant loops. When they clash, it triggers a storm of super hot, highly charged particles blasting out into space. It's called the solar wind. Astronauts in space can see it, but only when they close their eyes. Occasionally you see a little flash with your eyes shut, and that is an energetic particle coming through your head and interacting with the fluid inside your eye, and it makes a little light flash. And you see these every couple of minutes or so that you're awake with your eyes shut. If the astronauts were exposed to a lot more of the solar wind, it could kill them. During the Apollo program, in between two of the moon missions, there was an outburst on the sun that would have killed the astronauts if they had been there. So space radiation is a serious business. But on Earth, the solar wind isn't much of a threat because we have an invisible protective shield, a magnetic field generated by the planet's core. The 
very center of the Earth is the solid inner core. It's a hard iron crystalline ball. Then there's a thick layer of liquid iron, which is convecting, churning motions, which give rise to the magnetic field. To prove that an iron... Okay. So this is a solar eclipse. Basically, the moon, which is blocking out the sun, is between the Earth and the sun. And so that gives you a really good um, view of the corona when it happens. Again, you can't look at this, especially during a solar eclipse. Um, but usually you can use, um, I think you can use your camera phone or um, something. They, they, they sell special glasses that you can use to, to look at that. But that's the corona right there. Why the video so long? Yeah, and then that's when the moon starts to move a bit aside and then the brightness of the sun comes through. Okay, good place to stop. Wait.